Good evening. Welcome to the third lecture of Scientifically Speaking Season 2, an interactive online lecture series that connects world-renowned scientists to high school students and teachers. The topic of today's session is Move It with Motor Proteins, which will be delivered by Dr. Vaishnavi Ananta Narayanan from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Before we begin, I would like to thank our audience for an overwhelming response to our first two lectures. We had over 11,500 registrations and the talks were attended live on Zoom and YouTube by around 6,000 high school students and teachers from across the country. In case you missed any of these lectures, the YouTube links for the sessions are provided in the chat box. With that, I bring you back to today's session. We have with us Ms. Arnava Skola from the Cathedral and John Conn School, Mumbai, who will moderate the session. Arnava started her career with D.Y. Patel International School in Mumbai. She then furthered her career as a Chief Genetics Officer at Nutritional Genomics, where she developed an online course on nutrigenomics for professionals in the health and the fitness industry. She's currently teaching biology and environmental systems at the IB and IGCSE levels at the Cathedral and John Connell School. Arnavas is a double major in human and molecular genetics from Virginia Commonwealth University, USA, and in biotechnology from Ram Narayan Roya College, India. Welcome Arnavas, I request you to please take over from here and introduce our speaker for the day. Thank you so much, Vikram. A very good evening to our audience. It is an honor to be here today to moderate this talk. And before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Ashoka University for organizing this lecture series on cutting edge scientific topics. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Vaishnavi Ananta Narayanan. She has completed her PhD in biophysics at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden, Germany. She's an assistant professor, Embo Young investigator, and Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance Intermediate Fellow at the Center for Biosystem Science and Engineering, Indian Institute of Science. She works in a field that addresses questions like, how is the cell shape determined? And how do organelles in a cell communicate with each other? At present, her lab is interested in understanding how cellular organization is regulated by motor proteins and the cytoskeleton. Dr. Vaishnavi, a very warm welcome to the third lecture of Scientifically Speaking. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks, Arnavas, for the very nice introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen just now. All right, I hope everybody can see this. Yes. So I'd also like to thank by, uh, start by thanking Ashoka uh, for this uh, initiative. Um, and I'm going, not going to take any more time uh, thanking anybody else. And I'll jump right ahead with uh, moving it with motor proteins. So um, maybe we'll begin by revisiting the conundrum that we had posed early on. Uh, I think you would have seen this in my uh, abstract that I had sent along with this uh, talk announcement, which was trying to understand how our brain derives its energy. Uh, our brains are, of course, made up of uh, cells called neurons. These are specialized cells which end up taking a lot of energy simply because of the kinds of functions they need to perform. And some of our neurons are actually very, very long, up the order of a meter in length, in fact. So the question becomes, how does a neuron then make sure that it actually has all the energy it needs to perform its vital functions? So uh, I just want to reiterate here that the energy component of neurons is extremely important because when our body is deprived of oxygen or glucose, uh, in specifically in the blood, our brains are the organs that are most affected by this. So neurons such as these that you see on the left here have come up with a very elegant solution. They put mitochondria everywhere. And what do I mean by that? So the mitochondria that we typically uh, have in our bodies rely on something called motor proteins to carry mitochondria, to carry themselves essentially on these highways inside neurons. I'll talk about these in just a bit, but essentially mitochondria rely on these people here that I have depicted as people here called motor proteins to carry them along the entire length of the neuron. And by doing so, they're able to position mitochondria at several locations inside them, and thereby you have equal distribution of energy inside the neuron. Uh, 
If you were to take a closer look at a section such as this, you would end up seeing what looks like this. So this is a section of the neuron, uh, sim similar to what I had marked in the previous slide as a, a box. And uh, what we're looking at is a fluorescent microscopy movie of mitochondria that are fluorescently labeled. So you'll notice that during the course of this talk, I will repeat uh, the term fluorescence quite a bit. And this is because biology has re relied very heavily on uh, fluorescence as a technique to visualize uh, proteins and organelles such as the mitochondria. So what we have done here, uh, this is not my movie, but what has been done here is that you have a protein that localizes to the mitochondria that is fluorescently labeled. And you'll notice that the mitochondria actually are sitting along the entire length of this section of the neuron. In addition to some of them being stationary present, you have movements of these mitochondria in both directions. And so essentially what the neuron again here is doing and what we're seeing in action is the movement and localization of mitochondria along the entire length of the, um, the neuron. So essentially, these are motor proteins. These are tiny cellular machines. We'll take a really close look at them in just a few slides. But I'll start off by talking about these cellular machines and what it is that they actually move on. So I showed you a highway in the previous slide, right? So what is this highway? So these motor proteins actually move on cellular highways, which are the cytoskeleton. So as the name suggests, the cytoskeleton is actually the cell's skeleton. But contrary to the skeleton that we possess, these are not fixed or rigid entities, but rather they adapt dynamically to both external and internal stimuli. So what do I mean by this? A lot of you have probably seen this really nice video of, uh, this is an immune cell, a white blood cell in our body, which is uh, used to fight off infections, chasing a bacteria down before it eats it up and destroys it, right? So this requires a cell to perform several complex movements, including directed movement, which is what we're seeing here. So somehow the cell is able to move in a particular direction. And this is in fact being made possible by entities such as the cytoskeleton. So this is in fact viewing one component of a cytoskeleton inside a cell such as this. Again, this is a fluorescent microscopy movie of a protein that is a part of the cytoskeleton that is being viewed here. So and you can see very nicely that the cell sends out these protrusions that are filled with the cytoskeletal components. And in fact, if you did not have this, you would not have the movement of the cell. So essentially what I'm trying to say here is that the cytoskeleton is essential for several activities that require movement of the cell in and also cell division. So if you take a closer look at one component of a cytoskeleton, this is what it would look like. Um, there are several kinds of cytoskeletal filaments. We, for the, for the purpose of this talk, we will concentrate solely on something called microtubules. Uh, there are other cytoskeletal structures that we're not going to talk about today. There's another one which is, uh, that has been most recently identified called septins, which we won't even be talking about. But if you look at what these microtubules look like inside living cells, this is what you would see. So again, these are fluorescence microscopy images of cells that have the nuclei in blue. So everybody knows that the nuclei is where the DNA is located inside our cells, right? So this blue structure is in fact the nucleus and you have one, two, three, four, five cells in this field of view. You can't see the outlines of the cells, of course, but what you do see are these long strand-like structures that extend along the entire length of the cell. These are in fact the microtubules that have been fluorescently labeled. So microtubules are nothing but polymers inside the cell that can rapidly assemble and disassemble based on internal and external cues. Um, I'm going to tell you slightly a little more about microtubules. Don't worry about these names that you see here. Those are not super important. Uh, suffice to say that microtubules actually um, polymerize and depolymerize dynamically, and they do so in a head to tail fashion. And as a result, you have an asymmetry in the way that the microtubules are. So what it means is that one side of the microtubule is different from the other inside living cells. So one side is called the plus end and the other side is called the minus end. And this asymmetry is brought about because uh, of the way that the microtubules are built, right? So essentially, like the other cytoskeletal structure we saw, which was required for motility, microtubules are also required for motility, but more importantly for cell division when you have to break apart the, the nuclear material. So if you look at a living cell, uh, what you'd see is something that looks like this cartoon that I've depicted here. 
the microtubules emanate from one structure inside the cell. The plus ends uh, are away at the cell periphery and the minus ends are at the cell center, right? So the typical arrangement of microtubules in most cells is as follows. The plus ends are away at the cell periphery and the minus ends are at the cell center. And what motor proteins are able to do, these tiny cellular machines are able to do, is to bring about movement of cargo in both directions. One set of motor proteins carries cargo towards the minus end, and another set of motor proteins carries cargo away from the cell uh, center towards the cell periphery, towards the plus end that is. So these uh, machines, uh, motor proteins, are dynein and kinesin. Dynein is the one that's uh, what we've been studying in the lab, and I'll delve into this slightly at the very end. But kinesin is another motor protein that mocks box on microtubules. So both of these uh, motor proteins share a feature that they actually move on microtubules. There are other motor proteins that actually move on actin. That is another kind of cytoskeleton. And in fact, that uh, combination of filament and uh, cytoskeletal filament and motor protein is what's active in our muscle cells and are required for contraction. But for movement of most cargo in our cells, this cargo could be stuff that's entering the cell, that stuff that's leaving the cell, organelles in the, inside the cell like the mitochondria, all of these movements are predominantly mediated by dynein and kinesin. So dynein is the motor protein that moves stuff towards the cell center, towards the minor end, and antagonistically kinesin carries stuff away from the cell center towards the cell periphery. So essentially, dynein and kinesine are motor proteins that move on microtubules and carry uh, cargo in opposite directions. So how do motor proteins work? A lot of you have probably seen this animation previously, which is from um, the inner life of the cell. What you're looking at here is a nice microtubule that's uh, extending uh, across the cell. And when I play this movie, what you'll see is a motor protein. This is a kinesin that is carrying a large cargo. This is called a vesicle, but it doesn't matter. It's a cargo molecule that is being carried by kinesin. And when it moves, what you'll see is that it actually walks on a microtubule, very anthropomorphic, but it actually does walk on microtubules. So what it does is to attach on the one end to the cargo, and on the other end, it has two regions that it can use to bind to uh, the microtubule, not unlike our own legs, which we use to walk. So it has two of these uh, regions that it can bind to microtubule. And by alternating the attachment and detachment of these two legs from the microtubule, it can bring about movement of the, uh, the cargo because it's attached to the cargo. And if you look at how the motor protein is able to do this, it does so by repeated bouts of attachment and detachment to the microtubule, that is linked to the consumption of ATP. So ATP, as we all know, is the energy currency in our cells also produced predominantly in mitochondria in our cells. So this ATP is, is used up by each of these microtubule binding domains to alternate how they bind and detach from the microtubule. So because ATP is required for this process of repeated attachment and detachment, we call this an active process because there's energy that's being pumped into the system for this process to happen. So you could ask, why don't you just use diffusion as a mode of transport of, the, of these cargo inside living cells? The reason that, we, that most uh, large cargo, such as these vesicles, as well as our organelles, such as the mitochondria, cannot do away with active movement and just use diffusion for their movement inside the cell is precisely because they are large. Uh, so diffusion is quite slow for such large entities. Additionally, when you look at how the, uh, the internal structure of the cell is, it is quite a crowded environment. So diffusion is quite uh, constrained inside the cell. And as a result, what motor proteins help do is to actually move these to locations where they are required, right? So this is uh, basically the way that motor proteins have been um, known to function. So the question is, how do you actually study these motor proteins? Uh, but before we go to that, I want to quickly introduce you to fluorescence that I've been speaking about quite a bit. See, I think all of us really uh, know what fluorescence is because of our high school uh, classes. We know that uh, when a, a substance is fluorescent, it can absorb light of a specific wavelength. Uh, its atoms get excited to a high energy state, and they, when they come down to a low energy state, they do so by emitting a photon.
Uh, typically, these photons are longer wavelengths and lower energy. Um, so this is the phenomenon of fluorescence that all of us are familiar with. But the big break breakthrough uh, for biology in general and visualizing uh, biology came when uh, GFP or the green fluorescent protein was discovered. So green fluorescent protein is actually from um, was first extracted from uh, jellyfish. And what it does is actually absorb blue light and emit green light precisely because of fluorescence. And in fact, this uh, one discovery has transformed cell biology because we can now start thinking of all the possibilities that we can do. So essentially what this allows us to do is to visualize every single protein that you have. In fact, this went on to win its discoverers um, the Nobel Prize in 2008. Uh, but what this GFP allows us to do is to visualize any favorite protein of yours inside a living cell. How does it do that? Because the GFP is a protein and has a sequence. And if you attach your favorite gene sequence with that of GFP, when this gets translated, what you actually get is your favorite protein plus GFP. And this is how we can molecules inside living cells. So all you really need to do is to shine a light blue light at your samples. And if you have a microscope, which is a modified version of what you probably have been using in your schools, you will actually end up um, see the fluorescent molecule wherever it is, it is inside the cell. And the, the best part about this is that you can visualize the molecule in space and time, uh, in real time that is, right? So this was a aside about fluorescence microscopy, but let's get back to motor proteins. So how can we study motor proteins? So if you want to do this using fluorescence, there are a couple of ways that you can do this quite nicely, in fact. And in fact, this has been something that has been under development for a very long time. A lot of people have successfully used this to study motor proteins. So the first thing that you have to do to start off these assay is to purify motor proteins and the microtubule, tubulin that is, from uh, organisms and add the conditions suitable for its movement, including ATP and other buffers. So typically when you have, uh, when you purify these motor proteins and tubulin, you get this from the brain. No surprise, because there's a huge amount of uh, of these proteins and inside the brain. So all you really need to do now is to add uh, energy, which is ATP, and you also have to add a buffer so that everything remains happy inside these systems. And what I mean by these systems is literally uh, on a glass uh, cover slip. So that's why these, these techniques are called in vitro. Vitro means glass in Latin. And essentially what you're really doing is purifying these machines um, and their tracks from uh, organisms and getting them to work on a glass slide. Um, the first assay that you could do is something called a filament gliding assay, wherein the motor proteins are these green and uh, purple things here that are stuck to the glass surface. And these polymerized uh, microtubules are flowed into the chamber. The, tubulin, the microtubule here is now fluorescently labeled. And these motors will now, of course, try walking on the microtubule because they are motor proteins. But the problem they'll encounter is that now that they are stuck to the glass light, they can't physically walk by themselves on the microtubule. What they end up doing is actually then um, ex exerting forces on the microtubule and moving them in a direction opposite to their actual walking movement. So essentially what this means is that motor proteins are not just capable of physically translocating and thereby transporting cargo inside the cells, they can actually exert forces inside the cell. And this is how I'll tell you later, they bring about cell division. But for now, let's just focus on this. What will happen now is that when these motors start to move, they'll start pulling on these uh, filaments and cause the movement of these filaments. This is the microtubule in this case. Um, and if you actually look at a video of a microtubule, uh, sorry, a filament or a microtubule gliding assay in action, you will see something like this. These are all uh, microtubules that are on a lawn of motor proteins, and you can see that they're gliding very nicely. And this is made possible because the motors underlying them are actually providing the force required for their movement. In the second assay, uh, which you can do fluorescently with these motor proteins, is that of a motor stepping assay. This is kind of a reversal of what you see here. In this instance, the microtubule is stuck down to the glass and you put in fluorescently labeled motor proteins. So what then happens is that the motors attach to regions on the microtubule and start moving um, in a nice uh, coordinate, in, in a nice fashion. Uh, 
And if you look at what this looks like under a fluorescence microscope, these are the microtubules in red. And these dots that you see appearing and disappearing are motors that are binding to the microtubule, moving and then detaching, right? So essentially what these two uh, techniques afford us is to be able to study the motor protein in great detail. We can look at how much they move while they consume one molecule of ATP. We can understand um, the kind of coordination that is required for the movement and so on. There's a lot of things that you can get from these movies. So now I'm gonna switch gears slightly, having given you all this background, to talk about the motor protein, dynein. Dynein is, has been my favorite protein for a very long time, since my PhD, in fact. This is a super busy slide. Do not worry about any of these names. Just look at this molecule here. It has two microtubule binding regions, like the kinesine that we saw previously. And it has another region. This is, in fact, what it will bind with uh, the cargo, right? So essentially, you have microtubule binding regions. You have a region that binds and hydrolyzes ATP. And there's a region for binding the cargo. This is for all practical purposes. It's very similar to the kinesin, except that rather than moving away from the cell center, it will move towards the cell center. So anything that needs to be carried to within the cell is mediated by dynein. In fact, uh, several viruses end up hijacking dynein because they end up moving towards the cell center, right? So essentially, this is a protein that we have been interested in in a very long time. And when you look at what kinds of functions dynein performs, uh, there's a variety of processes that are mediated by dynein. So like we saw previously, cargo transport is something dynein does. Organelle positioning, again, uh, the movement of mitochondria inside the neurons, for example, is also mediated by dynein. Additionally, another thing that dynein can do is making sure that the cell division apparatus is in the right place during cell division. I'll show you an example of this in just a bit. So this is uh, a f the first uh, function here, which is that of cargo transport. So this is a cell. You're not seeing the outline here, but essentially this is a cell. The nucleus is somewhere around here. N marks where the position of the nucleus. And we're looking at fluorescently labeled cargo inside these cells. We're not looking at the dynein here, but we're looking at the cargo, which serves as a proxy for us for motor protein activity. And what you'll notice is that there are several tracks that several cargos that move very nicely towards N, meaning it's moving towards the nucleus and thereby the minus ends of microtubules, indicating that these cargo are being moved by the dynein motor protein. Now, when you take away the dynein completely or you affect its ability to function, you then see a very drastic difference in the numbers of movement of, uh, of these molecules towards the minus end, indicating that for these movements, you actually require dynein. So too, uh, I spoke about the positioning of the cell division apparatus, right? So in this cell here, you're looking at the nuclear material and you'll notice that during this phase of cell division, there is a movement of this apparatus towards the cell center as well as a reorientation. It moves, um, it pivots essentially. And this movement and uh, reorientation is dependent on dynein because if you take away the dynein or affect its activity again, then you see that this is completely abrogated. So essentially these are very uh, different functions of dynein that take place across uh, the different cell cycle stages, right? Um, it's interesting to note that there is a single kind of dynein that, that performs all these different functions. So the question then becomes, how do you make sure that dynein is in the right place at the right time to perform these activities? Because you can imagine that if dynein were not, let's say bound to cargo, that it would continue to walk along the microtubule while it's consuming ATP, but not doing any useful work. So it could be, so the question is, how can you then regulate dynein activity? Uh, this is an example of a stepping assay, which was performed by, with dynein. Uh, the microtubules are in blue and the red dots are dynein molecules that are put into this chamber. And you'll notice that the red dots actually sit on the microtubule, but they're not really moving. Then if they were moving, you'd see them doing, moving either in this direction or in this direction, but rather they're just sitting on one spot and after some time, they go away. So this means that dynein is not really active in this case. So what these guys went on to find is that you actually need a complex of three proteins, uh, the dynein, of course, a regulatory protein called dynactin, and the cargo uh, itself. So essentially, the cargo adapter helps dynein bind to cargo. So these three proteins together are required for you to have nice movement of dynein on the microtubule. You'll now see the stark difference between these two cases. Here, green is dynein. And you'll see that as soon as uh, you have all three together, you start seeing these nice movements along the microtubule. 
So this is a cartoon showing the same, uh, the requirement for both dynactin, which is a regulator of dynein, a cargo adapter that helps dynein bind to cargo. Only when all three come together, do you have cargo binding to, uh, sorry, did you have cargo moving uh, using dynein? And dynein is active in this instance. So, um, so I mentioned that these are all in vitro experiments, right? So you control precisely what you put into these systems to see what you do actually end up seeing. So in this instance, you have only dynein. In this instance, you only have these three proteins as well as of course the buffers and ATP and so on. So given this is the case, it, it, it does, is a super great system for trying to understand motor function, but then it doesn't really tell us what could happen inside a living cell. Because remember I told you inside a living cell, it's not just these three complex that are present. You have several different things all acting on dynein. Uh, it's a super crowded environment and so on. So while these in vitro experiments are great for understanding uh, specifically the motor function, these are not gonna tell us how these motors will function inside living cells. And for this reason, we actually ended up trying to understand function of dynein inside a living cell by using a variation of a microscopy, fluorescence microscopy technique that allows us to perform something you could think of as a stepping assay, but using the cell's microtubules itself. So here you're looking at a cell, the outline is here, the nucleus is somewhere around here. And you'll notice, notice these bright spots that are flicking around. So these are in fact dynemes, single molecules of dynein that are uh, not unlike what we see in our stepping assays uh, that we, uh, we've seen in vitro. Only thing, these are actually uh, living cells that we're looking at. So uh, we use this technique now to try and understand how dynein actually uh, comes together along with its other two components to uh, the dynactin as well as the cargo adapter to be active and to carry out its functions. Uh, we can of course track these single molecules in space and time to understand how they perform. And to cut a very long story short, we have an idea of how this might be happening inside living cells. I won't uh, go into the details of this, but I'd like to now um, end uh, in a couple of slides in fact, by telling you why is this even important, right? So I go back to what I had said uh, in my abstract about neurodegeneration and cancer. Uh, this is again a neuron. Uh, it has these nice long projections. And in the first instance, you see a bunch of cargo that are sitting all along the microtubules. They are also, in fact, when I play the movie, movie, you'll see that they're also moving. But to get a clearer picture of exactly what is moving in which direction, what the researchers have done in this movie is to bleach this particular region. Bleaching just means you're taking away the fluorescence of all the molecules in that region. And you look at what happens uh, to the, uh, so essentially this region that is bleached will now be occupied by uh, molecules that are moving and occupying this bleached region. So you'll see that here. So the bleaching is done and then you start seeing the unbleached molecules coming in and occupying. And you'll notice that there is a really nice movement of cargo in both directions. And this kind of cargo movement is essential for a neuron's function. This cargo could be mitochondria like we previously saw, but other kinds of uh, cargo, which are required for synaptic activity, for example, are also essential. And in context of neurodegeneration, what one of the things that is uh, very stark and that happens alongside the progression of the disease is a breakdown of this transport machinery. So this breakdown could occur either by taking away the microtubule itself, by making, uh, breaking up the microtubule, for example, or by affecting how the motor performs. So this is a snapshot of all the things that could go wrong with uh, this transport inside neurons. And Understanding how the motor protein is controlled could help us possibly understand the mechanisms underlying health, but also new, uh, disease such as neurodegeneration. And finally, uh, I mentioned that microtubules and motor proteins are involved in cell division, right? So what you're looking at here is a cell that's undergoing division. This green is the nuclear, uh, so the green is microtubules that forms the nuclear division apparatus and in red is a nuclear material. And you'll notice that the microtubules are dynamically rearranging, so too the nuclear material is, material is being pulled apart. And this is done because you have motor proteins exerting the force required to pull apart the nuclear material. And what has been a focus of study in recent years is seeing if we can use some of these kinesin proteins that are required in this process as targets for cancer, because these kinesins are specific to, uh, to uh, cell division, you can actually think of using these as targets for combating cancer. 
Uh, of course, dynein we may not be able to use as a target simply because it's useful for it's used in other it, it, it's required for other cellular functions, right? So these kinases, on the other hand, some of them are specific to cell division and hence can be thought of targets. So um, the final takeaways from I think the talk, if you don't remember anything, you this is sufficient if you take, take a look at this. Uh, microtubules and the my, uh, motor proteins uh, act together to perform a wide range of functions inside all of our cells. And understanding how the motor protein uh, actually carries out its functions inside living cells could help us understand the mechanisms underlying both health and disease. And finally, I think motor proteins are cool. Um, I'd like to end also by thanking the people that uh, have been doing the work in the lab, Nirikshan specifically, um, and Abhishek for the title of this talk, as well as uh, funding. So I'm happy to take your questions now. Hi, Vaishnavi. Thank you so much for taking our time and sharing your research with us. I think a lot of high school students who are watching this talk will also now think that the motor proteins are cool too. And um, there are a lot of interesting questions that are lined up. So one of the questions um, is that, are some mitochondria stationary in the neuron? And if they are, why are they stationary? That's a great question. Um, so yes, uh, in fact, the majority of the mitochondria are stationary inside neurons. And that's because, like I mentioned previously, the mitochondria are really long um, cells. Uh, the production of mitochondria is on the one end, and then they are required to be transported to the other end, of course, with motor proteins. But along the way, there are stations where you can dock mitochondria, so to say, so that you have a, a source of energy close by in the vicinity. And this is all, all along the, uh, the neurons, you will have mitochondria docked at these stations, so to say, so that you have energy distributed equally all along the cell. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, another question we have is that if the mitochondria are damaged or impaired, how will it impact the neurons function and then overall impact the body? Yeah, that's a great question. This is one of the things that happens uh, with the progression of neuro neuroregeneration, right? So typically when mitochondria are damaged, they uh, are taken uh, through a process of something called mitophagy, which is the cell itself destroying the damaged mitochondria. And uh, one of the things that happens during neuro neuroregeneration is a breakdown of this process of mitophagy, which means that uh, you produce something called reactive oxygen species quite in quite a high level. And this means that the neuron eventually will end up dying. Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, it is important that the damaged mitochondria are actually destroyed uh, as soon as possible because otherwise they're going to end up killing the neuron itself. And that's what happens in several uh, neurodegenerative diseases as well. Thank you. I, I am hoping we have more motor questions because I think the mitochondria are taking the limelight right now. <laughs> yeah, I think this one's with respect to the white blood cell video that you mm. showed and it chasing the pathogen. Mm -hmm. So there's a question, how does the WBC know which pathogen to follow? Yeah. And, uh, as it was chasing a specific one in the presentation. So yeah. Yeah, I think it goes by whichever one is. Uh, so essentially, these guys have uh, the bacteria let out chemical cues uh, of its presence, right? So uh, the cell will just integrate one, uh, the position of these cues that it receives, and it will typically go after the one that's closest to it. Um, that's what I presume. I don't work on this, but this is what I presume would happen. Uh, but yeah, it, there are chemical cues that, the, that the, uh, along the chemical gradient is what the cell is following. Okay, so there's another question uh, with respect to motor proteins. How fast do these motor proteins move along microtubules? Yeah, so uh, typically both dynein and kinesins can move at the order of one micrometer per second, which is actually pretty fast for within a cell. So you can typically forget neurons, but our, uh, typically our other cells are about, let's say, tens of micrometers long. So it can traverse the entire cell length if you were traveling from one end to the other in an, a matter of minutes. So these are actually pretty fast for the motor. Thank you. Also, another one with respect to microproteins is, is there a limit to the size of the cargo that the microproteins can carry? Or can they carry any amount of weight, however large the organelle is? Yeah, so that's another wonderful question, right? So when motor proteins typically act on larger organelles or larger cargo uh, in general, uh, you end up recruiting more than one motor. 
So a lot of motors actually end up carrying, let's say, a single mitochondrion. And that's because the surface area of these organelles is pretty large. So you can accommodate several motor proteins, and that's how they end up actually working together to bring about movement of uh, larger organelles, such as the mitochondria. And of course, there also is a kind of a geometry problem when you think about how uh, big the organelle is versus how big the microtubule is underlying the organelle. And so even though you have several motors being able to bind to the uh, organelle, there are only some at any given point in time that can attach to the microtubule as well. So these are considerations we have to take into account, yes. Okay, another question, thank you for the answer that was really well explained. Another question is with respect to histone, non-histone chromosomal proteins, are they motor proteins? And if they are not positively charged, how are they able to bind to the negatively charged DNA? Ah, so this is beyond my expertise here, but there are non-microtubule-based uh, motor proteins that are, uh, that are acting on, of course, uh, DNA. Uh, some actually bind specific regions, sequences in the DNA. I don't quite know exactly how these act uh, because the mechanism is slightly different from how uh, microtubule based, based motor proteins, of course, act. But the commonality between the two, of course, is that these are um, active in the sense that they consume ATP and bring about uh, either uh, movement of some parts of the DNA or they attach to and bring about changes to the DNA itself. Thank you. Another question is how fast can microtubules be formed and destroyed in order to allow the white blood cell to move and chase the pathogen? Ah, so um, the microtubule dynamics are not as essential. There is a reorientation of the microtubule network uh, in, during these, uh, these um, uh, chasing events, let's say. But what's more important is the actin, uh, which was what the movie I showed was uh, right next to the chasing video. And that's, again, uh, you can grow and shrink, let's say, a few microns per uh, minute. Um, and so this is a pretty rapid process as well. Thank you. Uh, another question was, how does the attachment of a phosphate group from ATP change the shape of a motor protein? Yeah, so the attachment of ATP and the hydrolysis of ATP essentially causes a change, uh, let's say, a change in the relative positions of different parts of the motor protein, what you'd call a conformational change. And this is because uh, upon attachment of the ATP and the hydrolysis, you bring about a change in the way that the uh, ATP packs into the structure and that translates to a movement of the motor. So this is how a motor protein is able to translate uh, chemical energy to mechanical energy uh, and something that's called a mechanochemical cycle, yeah. Thank you. Another great question is what stimulus triggers the relative movement of motor proteins along the cytoplasm mm -hmm. or is the movement randomized? Yeah, so this is something that has been keeping me up at night, right? So uh, this is in fact going to be the focus of our research for a long time to come. So the way that motor proteins choose to attach to and detach from microtubules is seemingly random. Uh, it's a stochastic as you, process, as you call it. So the thing is, motor proteins can bind and uh, detach from microtubules and from their cargo in a stochastic or a random fashion. So given that this is the case, it's very interesting to then think about how you could bring about complexity uh, in cellular organization. It's not a deterministic process. Um, nothing, the motor protein doesn't know that it has to go there and we can't really predict in a deterministic fashion that this is exactly what's gonna happen. But you can predict with some certainty when a motor protein is acting on this organelle, what will end up happening to it in some time from then. Um, and so this is a very important question. I think uh, hopefully some of you in the audience will end up working on it alongside me in the future as well. But how do you then translate something that is random to something that you can predict? Lovely. I think these tiny machines have like a huge role to play in our cellular structure and in the cells. Okay. Uh, another question about motor proteins is that the motor proteins movement seem to be quite similar to the movement of humans. Mm. Why and how did such movement evolve in motor proteins? Aren't there any more efficient methods of motility similar to like the flagella? Right. So, um, yeah. So the movement that you see is anthropomorphic, but I wouldn't say it's exactly like a human being because uh, dynein, for example, although it does do uh, hand over hand is what they call this movement where you put one head in, or leg in front of the other, um, there is a staggered hand over hand, which means that the front leg can go forward a few steps in, cons uh, in consecutive steps, that is, before the 
uh, leg at the back catches up. So there are several different kinds of uh, movement of these motor proteins. Um, I don't quite know if they, you can draw a link between how move, uh, humans move versus how motors move. But um, there are also the, 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 uh, the fact that these, some of these motors move in a hand over hand fashion uh, is, a, is a consequence of something called dimerization. So dimerization is having two of the same kind. So if you, looked at, if you look at the two halves that are actually performing these movements, they're identical. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't have the two, uh, the two components, then what you'd end up is actually just a hop before it moves away, right? Because once the detachment, so when one, in this case, when you have the two identical halves, one half remains attached while the other half is moving forward, the leg forward. Uh, if you were not to have the second half, then what you'd end up having is just a hopping movement, just a one, single step before it attaches. And, but this is actually what, ends up happening in uh, the motors that are, perform that are performing the activities of our heart muscle, for example, as well as the, uh, any kind of muscle that you have, the contraction that happens. Those are the myosin and actin filaments that we have. Those are single-headed, meaning that they can't actually do this processive movement is what it's called. Um, but what they do instead is to uh, form clumps of motors, all of them in groups, and as a result, even if one of them detaches, several others are attached to the filament at one point in time. So there are several different kinds of movements that uh, motors perform. This is not the only one. I just showed you one as an example because both kinesin and dynein can do that. Lovely. Uh, have you seen this sort of movement with respect to the stepping assay or the gliding assay? Right. Yeah, so that is very hard to perform, right? So uh, there's something that called the resolution that comes into effect when you're looking at uh, microscopy in general, right? And this is determined by a bunch of different factors. And the end result is that we cannot resolve something that is smaller than, let's say, uh, 200 nanometers in a good microscope. And if you look at these uh, structures and the, kind, the step size, in fact, the size between one step and the other is about eight nanometers. So we can't actually see this uh, happening in, in real time, but we can infer it based on how the intensity of the spot. So the spot that you see is actually a whole, uh, is a whole molecule, a uh, motor protein molecule with the two identical halves. This spot for every ATP it consumes, it moves by a small amount. It's a very, very small amount, but we can use some tricks of image processing to get this information from those kinds of stepping, stepping assays. But a lot of this has been, a uh, lot of these stepping kind of information has been gotten from uh, something called an optical trap experiment, where you can trap uh, motor proteins with laser uh, light, um, essentially with light, um, and you can apply forces on them and also measure the kind of forces they perform and how they step and so on. Mm -hmm. and that's, you can't visualize the motor at that time, but you can see what it does. I feel these all these experiments and uh, collecting data and seeing these fluorescent images would be very mesmerizing. Exactly. So I, as the first time I saw these molecules was my first day of my PhD and I've been hooked ever since. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. I know you spoke about this in brief uh, during the end of your, towards the end of your talk, but can you elaborate a little more if there are any diseases associated with the structure and function, functional anomalies of microtubules? Oh, yes. Um, so I'll give you a very quick example, which is that of uh, neurodegeneration, right? So uh, if you look at Alzheimer's disease, which is one of the uh, most common kinds of neurodegeneration that we see even here in India, um, there is a production of a protein called tau that becomes something called hyperphosphorylated. So tau is typically a protein in healthy cells. It binds to microtubules and keeps them from depolymerizing. So the microtubule structure is maintained by tau in a normal healthy neuron. Uh, when you have neurodegeneration, specifically in Alzheimer's, you see that this uh, hyperphosphorylated tau, rather than being able to perform its normal function of keeping the microtubule structure intact, ends up not binding so much, it clumps and so on. And as a result, the microtubule structure is totally derailed. So this is in fact an effect of not tubulin mutations. There are other diseases that cause tubulin mutations, but uh, most of the commonly seen uh, features of some of these uh, diseases, including neurodegeneration, is not directly a mutation in tubulin, for example, or the motor protein, but rather an effect of another protein that maintains the tubulin structure, the microtubule structure, for example. Uh, and this is an example from Alzheimer's. 
Thank you. That's interesting to know. Uh, this question was asked before with respect to speed of the motor, pro mm -hmm. motor, um, motor proteins moving. But uh, just another add-on to that, do kinesin and dianin move at the same speed or do they have different speeds? Yeah, so our bodies, kinesin and dianin, seemingly have the same speed, which is interesting. So they have both move at around an average of a micrometer per second. Does it also, so this is with respect to two different motor proteins, can this change uh, temporally? So with respect to time, can the speed change or do they still maintain? Oh, yes. Um, so uh, in living cells, um, of course, you don't have tracks, the microtubule tracks that are totally um, free of obstacles, right? So you have tons of stuff inside the cell. I should have shown a picture of it, but it's a really nice animation by David Goodsell, which shows you how crowded it is within a living cell. It's amazing. Anything moves at all to me, but essentially it's a very crowded environment. And sometimes what happens is that uh, these motor proteins can encounter roadblocks. Uh, this could be other proteins. It could be stuff, stuff sitting on the microtubule. It could be other organelles and so on. And when that happens, of course, um, sometimes they slow down, but uh, in, in some instances they come to a complete halt and then detach and go to a different place. So this of course happens. Okay. Lovely. Another question is, uh, a lot of ATP is used in the process of moving over the motor protein. How does the body manage to send selective amounts of ATPs to these areas? Oh, uh, so in most of our cells, ATP is not limiting, uh, except of course, when in conditions where there is a problem with both uh, glucose or oxygen, uh, which is when, uh, which is what mitochondria use as their uh, starting points to convert it into ATP, of course. Um, so in neurons, on the other hand, uh, like I mentioned, it is possible that you could have an asymmetry in the amount of ATP that you have on one end, one from one end to the other if you don't have mitochondria located along the entire length of the neuron. And in that instance, of course, it's because you can then put mitochondria at specific locations all along the neuron so that you don't have this problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if there is no central nervous system present within motor proteins, what coordinates their movements, what determines their speed and direction of motion, and when to carry and let go of cargo? Like I mentioned, these are all stochastic. So it means these are all random uh, events, which is why it's so amazing that it even happens, right? Because you can, you're essentially just integrating a bunch of random events and bringing about something really complex. Um, binding and detaching to microtubules or to cargo is a random event. Uh, the movement, the directionality of movement, for example, is something that is determined by what is more energetically favorable for the, for the motor protein to do upon addition or binding of ATP and its subsequent hydrolysis. So that is favored by energetic, energetics, of course, the directionality. Um, but apart from this, a lot of the kinds of movements that you see of these motors are stochastic events. Um, and they don't really have... Uh, a way that you can say that this is where the motor protein is going to bind next and so on. So that is a stochastic event and or when it is going to detach, for example. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question is, do these microtubules crisscross each other? Mm -hmm. If yes, then how, do, how is travel possible in such uh, cases? Yes, it's, it's a very difficult uh, environment for, the, for these motor proteins to traverse. So typically, like I mentioned, you can, they come across roadblocks very, very frequently. Um, so I can give you a quick uh, um, a research study, uh, results of a research study. Um, so kinesins uh, are pretty bad at traversing any kind of roadblock, uh, whether it is a crisscrossing microtubule or any other kind of roadblock that you have. So what they'll typically do is to detach from the spot and go to a different place and do whatever. But uh, when you look at dynein, right? And this is because I'll tell you why. Um, I didn't mention the structural aspects of microtubules, but the microtubules are formed by these head to tail arrangements of these, uh, uh, these tubulin heterodimers is what I mentioned, right? So you can have 14 of these head to tail arrangements uh, to form the hollow structure called the microtubule. So ky kinesins move along one single line of these, um, of these uh, arrangements of head to tail arrangements of the uh, tubulin, which is why they can't really, and when they encounter traffic, get rid of it and go somewhere else, for example. But the dynings on the other hand can move to a different uh, arrangement of head to tail arrangement of these uh, proteins and thereby overcome this obstacle by going around it, so to say. So yes, there is a lot of traffic inside cells. Some motor proteins are good at overcoming them, others are not. <laughs> 
Another interesting question, uh, Vaishnavi, is since mitochondrial DNA is generally maternal, maternally inherited and it plays an important role in neurological disorders, does it determine neurological health? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, I haven't quite thought of this except in context of metabolic disorders where it is a lot more important, of course. Uh, in neurodegeneration in general, mitochondrial, um, so there's a very interesting way in which uh, mitochondria are presented, uh, form and function of mitochondria presents itself in context of neurodegeneration. And this is something in fact, which we're also studying in the lab, which is that mitochondria, unlike what we see in textbooks are not small distinct entities just sitting around. They form these long networks of mitochondria, not unlike what I, sh I showed in the neuronal uh, mitochondria movie, right? So these uh, mitochondria in neurodegeneration are fragmented, meaning that they're broken up quite a bit. They appear as spherical uh, objects. Um, and as a result, their function is also quite modified. So the form of mitochondria is acutely linked to the function of mitochondria. So, but the, 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 but the reason this happens is something that is still under study. We have a hypothesis that we're working on. The mitochondrial DNA is not involved in breaking up uh, as in the proteins that are, that are uh, derived from the mitochondrial DNA are not involved in the breaking up of mitochondria. Uh, these are nuclearly uh, encoded DNA, uh, proteins. Uh, but essentially, um, I don't quite know if there's been a link between the mitochondrial DNA function and neurodegeneration, but I only know of it in context of, of metabolic disorders, which of course is very important. And that's why the maternal angle also really plays a huge role. That's actually interesting. Yeah. Into. Another question is, how can we study motor protein mutations in vivo if they are lethal to the organism? Mm. So you can do something called a conditional uh, mutation. Uh, this is something that's been uh, used quite uh, uh, extensively in biology, right? To study activity of lethal proteins, right? Uh, and what you do is you either you use uh, temperature or pre presence of a chemical compound to activate uh, the mutated version of the gene. And then you see how the uh, the the organism or the cell under study is changing as a result of the mutated version of the gene. So this would require you to be able to control precisely when you turn it on and turn it off. So for example, you can do temperature, you have temperature sensitive mutations that for example, at higher temperature, you switch it on and lower temperature, you switch it off. So you can switch the organism or let's say the cells to higher temperature to lower uh, and lower temperature to study their effects. Lovely. Is there a difference in how the cytoskeleton work in sickle cell shaped mm. uh, red blood cells of an individual with sickle cell anemia? Yes, um, yes, that's a great question again. Um, so the shape of the RBC is of course, something that's quite uh, important for the movement, for its movement within our body's blood vessels, right? And this uh, shape actually changes as it squeezes through small vessels inside our body. And this is the underlying uh, spectrum is what it's called. Um, the cytoskeletal arrangement is quite unique in RBCs. And of course, this is completely perturbed when you, uh, when you have sickle cell anemia. And one of the reasons why you actually end up having uh, problems when you have sickle-shaped RBCs. That's definitely there, yeah. Okay, lovely. So another question I would like to ask that generally the shape of an RBC, uh, it doesn't change as dynamically as it does with respect to a WBC. So um, what is the yeah. mechanism going? So it's not, there... a, it's not a rearrangement of, uh, so it's, let's, let me put it this way. The deformations of the RBC are not due to um, these dynamic rearrangements of the actin, like the actin that we saw previously, but it is just a shape change that is brought about by the unique, um, so it has this donut shaped, um, shape that is typical right and that's because it can uh, very simply put change this in multiple different ways without uh, changing the um, properties of the rbc uh, so to say so i mean i think i'm not giving you a direct answer that is easy to understand but essentially you can deform the rbcs in multiple ways mm -hmm. without really changing its internal structure that much which is why you're able to have uh, it's being able to squeeze through small, uh, tiny vessels and so on. Okay. 
Thank you. Another question is, do motor proteins work alone or have some interacting partners as well besides ATP? Oh, uh, with respect to th their inherent ability to move, um, yeah, so in, uh, in these in vitro conditions, you actually need, of course, a buffer to maintain uh, the physiological conditions. Uh, you need magnesium. Um, but if you look at inside living cells, um, if you look at other proteins that are partners for the motor proteins, of course, like I mentioned, even in the case of dynein, uh, it requires this regulatory protein called dynactin and a cargo adapter, which helps dynein bind to the cargo itself to actually be able to act. Even in the presence of ATP, if you don't have these two, you will not find dining able to be uh, activated. In fact. Thank you. Another question is, does the stereochemistry of the molecules affect any attachment process between the motor protein and the microtubule? Mm, I'm not quite sure what stereochemistry means in this instance. Uh, so I'm assuming the structure of, uh, or the yeah. arrangement of the amino acids, um, yeah, so uh, yes, so the conformation change that I mentioned, uh, binding hydrolyzed ATP, is a result of a rearrangement of portions of the, of the protein um, with respect to the whole. So uh, the amino acids, of course, remain the same. It's just that the way they are uh, physically located in space changes slightly as a result of binding and hydrolyzing ATP. Thank you. And we just have time for the last question. So the last question is, what are neurofibrillary tangles? What is the basic feature of a two-headed kinesin molecule? And how does this molecule move if the concentration of ATP falls? Okay. So the first question is with respect to neurodegeneration, which is Alzheimer's, a bunch of proteins that go wrong and form these structures that essentially make it impossible for some of the, so if it is specifically with respect to the cytoskeleton and microtubules, they make it hard for motor proteins to actually move inside neurons. So that is NFTs. Uh, the second was with something to do with kinesin, right? Yeah. So the second part to the question was, just a second. One sec. Yeah. The second part was, what is the basic feature of a two-headed kinesin molecule? basic feature of a two-headed kinesin molecule. Uh, as with any motor protein, I'd say it has to have microtubule binding domains. It has to have regions, the tail specifically, that binds to the cargo yeah. and some region that can bind and hydrolyze ATP, which is typically near the microtubule binding region. Yeah. And what would happen if the concentration of ATP falls? Yeah. So like I mentioned, inside, uh, inside living cells, it's, it's not that uh, common that you would have uh, local uh, sinks or local areas where you have uh, that are devoid of ATP. But of course, in an in vitro setup, you can uh, actually not put an ATP, right? And then you can understand what happens to the motor protein. Um, and uh, when you don't have motor protein, some motors like the, um, the kinesin actually attaches very strongly to the microtubule and doesn't move, but it attaches very strongly. On the other hand, dynein will actually, uh, actually the other way around, uh, dynein will detach, um, what did I say? So in the absence of ATP, dynein will actually remain bound strongly to the microtubule and kinesin will actually detach, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much once again, Vaishnavi, for sure. clarifying all the doubts possible. I and a very easy to understand uh, manner. And I'm sure that you've inspired and motivated a lot of students to now look into motor proteins. I do hope so. <laughs> and the role that they're going to play in Alzheimer's and maybe Parkinson's and uh, probably come up with a solution to cancer. Sure. So thank you so much for taking out the time and being here with us. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And I would also like to thank... Um, a big thank you to the audience for all the questions that have kept this discussion alive and to Ashoka University for making this happen. Uh, I'll hand it over to you, Vikram. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vaishnavi and Arnavas for your valuable time. Vaishnavi, your talk was fantastic. We loved your presentation and I'm sure our audience enjoyed the session as much as I did. The audience interest was reflected in the large number of questions that we received during the talk. I think I saw about 650 questions in the Q&A box. We would love to have you back on Scientifically Speaking very soon.
I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the organizing committee for their continued support and feedback, without which the series would not have been possible. 13 distinguished educators from schools across India have helped us put the series together. Uh, we will be sharing a recording of today's session via email to all registrations, and the video will also be available on Ashoka's YouTube channel. I would also request all, your part all the participants to take a minute to fill our feedback form. Your feedback is important for us to deliver high quality lectures. The link to the feedback form is in the chat box and will also be emailed to you. The next session of Scientifically Speaking Season 2 is on August 25th, and the speaker for the session is Professor G. Mugesh, again from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. His session topic will be artificial enzymes, making molecules with a purpose. The registration link for this is also available in the chat box. Thank you once again for joining us. If you have any further queries regarding today's session, or would like to know more about Ashoka's unique interdisciplinary science programs, you can visit our website, www.ashoka.edu.in or write to us at apply at ashoka.edu.in or call us at the number on screen. See you on August 25th at 7 p.m. Till then, take care and stay safe.